Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Atlantic Wide Shark Conservancy's online enrichment program. So we are kicking off our first career feature with one of my favorite scientists. We have Dr. Lisa Natanson from NOAA. Um, so Dr. Natanson, if you want to introduce yourself to everyone at home. Hey, Marianne, thanks for having me. My name's Lisa Natanson, and I'm a research fisheries biologist with the National Marine Fisheries Service, which is part of NOAA. Uh, our lab is in Rhode Island, and I'm part of the Apex Predators Program which focuses on shark research, um, basic life histories such as age, growth, uh, reproduction, and food habits. And also we have a cooperative shark tagging program. Awesome. That's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so for all of our folks at home, um, so we're going to be talking with Dr. Natanson for the next half hour or so. And we have some questions lined up and we're going to be sharing some photos of Dr. Natanson working uh, in this job position. Uh, but if you have questions, you're welcome to comment in on those. And we're going to get through as many as we can this morning. Um, but we want to make sure we just want to remind everyone that we have people of all ages watching and with the live stream, you can see all of those comments pop up on the screen. So we want to make sure we're being respectful and that we are using appropriate language and everything we are saying since we have folks of all ages who are tuning in and watching. Um, so, you know, Dr. Natanson, if you can start off with everyone, and I'm going to share one of those photos that we have of you working in the field, um, because you just explaining, you know, your job title and what you do, um, that was a lot. So maybe if you want to break it down a little bit into, you know, what a typical day can look like and maybe some of those projects that you've been working on. Okay. Um, well, one of the things I like about the job is there's really not a typical day. We have a field season, for example, starting there that starts in about June and goes through September. Um, during that period of time, we spend a lot of time um, collecting samples. We do this by going to shark tournaments, which is where people um, fish for sharks for money and they bring the sharks in and we're able to dissect them for samples. This helps us because it's opportunistic. We can get the samples without actually having to go out and um, sacrifice animals ourselves. Um, I, in this picture you see here, I'm on a commercial fishing vessel. They let me go out on this uh, vessel and tag sharks. This shark's about to be released. I had just tagged it. And so we're able to go out and do that kind of thing. These trips are about a month long, uh, which is pretty exciting. We also do our own research surveys to collect uh, shark data. They are tagging trips, but unfortunately there are mortalities uh, associated with that. So we can get our life history information. So, uh, so basically the tagging aspect, we have a lot of people who tag for us, including ourselves, obviously, and they give us the data. And then when the shark is recaptured, uh, we get the data back and we share it with them. And we've had about 300,000 sharks tagged this way. It gives us a lot of data for information on distribution and migration of the sharks by species, size, and sex, um, which is very useful for conservation. You need to know where the sharks are. The other thing that I particularly specialize in is determining the age of a shark. Um, we need to use dissection to get uh, that uh, information because we use the shark vertebral column at this point. Um, they have vertebra that you can count band pairs and uh, they're similar uh, the not exactly to rings of a tree. We don't entirely know what the rings are. As you can see in this picture, um, we slice the vertebra and count um, what we consider a band pair, which is a light and a dark band. And that equates in a lot of species to um, an annual ring. So you would say, for example, this fish is four. It doesn't always work that way, but we don't want to get into too much detail here. <laughs> The other thing <laughs> that uh, I particularly do is shark reproduction. And um, again, that's something that right now we need to do by having um, deceased sharks. So we dissect them. We're actually working on projects that will um, compare lethal and non-lethal methods. So we're trying to make it so that all we'd have to do is get a blood sample 
so you wouldn't have to use a dead uh, animal, which would be great, less, less animal sacrifice. So um, that's on a day-to-day -day basis, I could be in the lab cutting vertebra, I could be on a boat collecting samples at a dock, um, or I could be writing a paper, just doing charts and graphs or, or entering data. So it's, it's kind of um, great not to have a, a typical day. And, and Marianne, as you know, sometimes we get a call and we have to run off and dissect something that's stranded on a beach. You've done that several times. <laughs> I have. It's always exciting when I get a call from you because <laughs> I know I'm going to go on some kind of adventure. <laughs> it is fun. <laughs> um, so let's, you know, in bringing up the, you know, looking at doing some of the dissections, you know, we do have a few photos of that, which, you know, before I pull this up to full screen, just for anyone at home, you know, it is a dissection photo. So you're going to see some of those internal anatomy parts. And it's a little bit of a messy photo, but, you know, Dr. Natanti is going to explain, you know, what's going on in this, but just to prepare everyone. Um, so you had mentioned how you, you know, get samples from both some of the fishing tournaments that take place, you know, as well as working with fishermen. Um, so we have a few photos, you know, if you want to explain a bit about when you go out, you know, what this process is to get those samples. So this, um, this was from a shark tournament in Massachusetts last year. And um, they had gotten a couple poor beagle sharks that we dissected. What happens is they bring them to the dock, they weigh them for the tournament. And then the um, owner of the fish, who's the person that caught it, um, allows us to dissect the fish. So we then um, basically just cut it open and do a large number, probably about 20 measurements of the shark on a reproductive condition to find out exactly um, how each of its organs is um, growing in relation to its body. We look at condition of the fish. We take samples not only for ourselves, but for other people who are doing DNA or parasite studies or any number of studies, olfactory studies, anything. Um, if people ask us, we'll, we'll take the samples if we can. Um, so in this particular case, um, we were at, at this point doing the reproductive um, uh, data collection. And then we'll take uh, usually the whole backbone now if they'll let us of the fish and then what other, whatever parts and then they take the fish and eat it. Now, when I first saw you for the first time and I got to see you, you know, cut up a shark in this way, I think one of the things that amazed me and you can see in this photo is, you know, especially for some of these larger species, in my head, you needed some really big type of equipment to be able to get these samples, but you know, you're using knives, correct? That's what you're yeah. seeing in this photo. If you can maybe talk a bit about the tools that you use when you're going out to get those samples. Yeah, everybody expects us to use big saws and things like that. I actually use what's called a six inch boner, which is a six inch knife with a semi-flexible blade. Um, the key is to keep your knife really sharp. And so I'm constantly sharpening the knife. So you need a knife, you need a wet, wet stone to keep it properly sharpened. You need uh, measuring tapes, um, calipers, which is a measuring device for a uh, much finer scale to get like uh, percents of millimeters, partial millimeters. Um, we don't use a lot of equipment, honestly. It's, it's mostly that knife that you need because you have to you know, cut through the fish to get inside and then cut some of the organs out and the, and the vertebral column out. If, if you know the anatomy of the shark, you don't need to use saws and things like that because you can find your way between the uh, cartilage. Sure, mm -hmm. being cartilage, not bone. So. And so the, you know, this photo showed at a tournament, um, but this photo here, <laughs> um, <laughs> where was this one? And, you know, uh, for some folks at home, because the size of what they're looking at, they might realize what species, yeah. but if you could give us some background on this photo. Yeah, I think this one was probably in Wellfleet. We get a lot of basking sharks in Wellfleet. Um, a lot of sharks in general wash up in Wellfleet for some reason. So this was a stranding that we got called on. And I'm trying to keep a lobe of the liver from floating off um, before we get a chance to weigh it, um, which is why I'm kind of straddling it and holding it there. It wasn't <laughs> overly successful, as I recall. You can see this fish is, is also fairly decayed. Um, a lot of times we don't get there 
you know, they strand after they've been um, washing around for a while offshore. But this is um, the kind of opportunistic sampling we're able to get because, of course, we're not people don't kill basking sharks, luckily, and uh, we don't get to see them very often. But uh, this was one of those situations. So we do the same kind of dissection, um, looking at at the food and the liver and and all that for the food habits people, which is why we're trying to keep this liver. But it is it's a big animal. It's over twenty feet long. Yeah. And, you know, having been one, you know, this is sometimes what we get the call for. Since you're based down in Rhode Island, we're up here on the Cape of, you know, a report comes in that a shark is stranded. So we'll go and try to find it for you. And sometimes it is really challenging when you get those calls. <laughs> you know, we're out there and we're looking, but you have to balance the tides that are happening to be able to get those samples. Um, and then can you maybe even talk a bit about then how that comes into the safety factor of, you know, when you're working out in the field, you know, and how that makes, you know, the safety part as well as how that maybe makes your job a bit more challenging of, you know, sometimes having to get this quick response to things. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. There's a huge safety component. Um, we've actually done basking sharks where the tide was coming up so fast and the waves were, were hitting us that it gets to the point where you just have to say, you know, it's not worth it. Um, but usually, um, especially when they're on the Cape and, and we call you, we obviously can't get there fast enough. It can take us sometimes four hours to get there, even if we leave immediately, depending on where the Cape, on the Cape it is. So if we're gonna get there at 11 and that's when the tide's gonna be high, it's kind of useless because we can't even get to the fish. So when you guys get to go there and kind of scope it out and say, first of all, yes, there is a fish. Second of all, it definitely is a shark because we've been called for things that aren't. And that you guys can get it kind of out of the tide or say, well, come at two because that's when the tide's going to start going down. It, it's really helpful to us because uh, as you can see, you know, in this picture, trying to keep the pieces from floating off, if we if we can't do it safely, it's just not worth it. And the, and the same as at sea, you know, certain weather conditions, we just can't, you, you can't work. Yeah. You know, you have to balance that. No sample is worth uh, somebody getting hurt. And I think one of the other parts that, you know, in being able to observe and be a part when you're doing these dissections in the field, um, you know, the other safety part that, you know, I recognized the first time I watched is the knives that you're using so that they work, you have to keep them so sharp and you're working as a team and you're trying to get all these different samples. But I remember, you know, everyone's kind of saying, I need you to stand back, you know, trying to get that room you know, how does that change from one species to another when you start talking about the size of the animals and the size of the samples you're trying to get? Well, it's kind of a, a certain working space that you need. Um, when I'm dissecting, I'm not paying attention to what's going on around me. I'm just paying attention to the fish. So if all of a sudden someone comes up behind me and I'm cutting, I, I might not know they're even there. Or you know, if a knife slips and unfortunately it's, I've slipped a couple into myself, you know, you, you can get hurt. Um, so a lot of times, you know, you, you really should, it, you know, everybody wants to get in and see what you're doing, but you got to be aware of, of what's going on. You know, uh, when we do the uh, sharks at the tournament, like in that last picture, you saw the, the woman was holding the shark open mm -hmm. um, there. People want to, you know, I'll start to cut from the, you know, cloaca up and people want to immediately stick their hands in. And I'm always like, do not stick your hands in there until I tell you to stick your hands in there because I'm cutting. And uh, I actually did cut my boyfriend because he dove his hands in there. Really? <laughs> and he's like, oh, you told me not to, but it wasn't bad, but still. Yeah. You know, I want to be cutting people. Because it is different, you know, being in that field environment. And I don't think everyone always realizes that, that you know, you think about a lab setting, there are the protocols, right. there are things you have to follow, but in the field, you have those same things and it's all about people's right. safety. And it, and it's also, you're going fast. You're trying to fight the tide or you're trying to get a shark done to put on somebody's uh, boat. So you're trying to get it done quickly and safely. And, you know, everybody has to be aware of that. Yeah. Well, let's transition and talk a bit about that then. We do have some photos of you here doing some of the sampling on the boat. Um, if you want to talk a bit about, you know, the species that you're working with in these photos and, you know, how it is that you catch them and then, you know, what happens once you've caught them and brought okay. them up. 
Well, this is, um, these are pictures from a research survey that we do every uh, other year, sometimes every uh, second year. Um, and we go um, on this particular case on a chartered longline vessel from Florida as far north as we can get, usually, you know, well into North Carolina. And this is a survey of a, a, a group of sharks called the large coastal sharks. And that includes, for example, this picture I think is a sandbar, um, black tip, hammerheads, duskies, tigers, um, that whole complex of fish, uh, sharp nose. So what we're trying to do is get uh, a count of the species along the coast. And that goes into management to um, monitor population size. We're also looking at distribution by size and sex and, and species composition. So the main thing we do on this is, is we go out and we uh, set 300 hooks, baited hooks. We let them soak for three hours, we pull it back, and then we go to the next station. We work 24 hours a day for about 47 days, okay? And get as many stations as we can done. So the main point is to get these numbers and we tag the majority of fish brought on board um, or in the water. And in this case, on the left-hand picture, I'm tagging the shark. Um, and on the right-hand picture, we're then cutting it loose. If a shark is small and we can bring it on board, we'll do that and take out the hook. Um, and in most cases, we, we can do that. Again, you go back to your safety factor, which is what's the weather like? Can we safely handle this shark on board or is it better for the shark and for us to just leave it in the water and, and cut it free? Um, so we basically do this, repeat this same thing um, in, until the 47 days are up. Wow. And so over a span, because you said in the beginning that, you know, with this program, over 300,000 sharks have been tagged in a span of 47 days. You know, what's about the average of how many sharks are tagged on that trip? Um, well, at this point in time, about 2,600, um, you know, with the current populations. Wow. And is that higher or less than, I guess, in previous years? Um, it's higher than uh, when we started this particular survey, the exact same um, methods we're using now, it was 1996. And I don't even think we had tagged 200. That was at the low of the populations. But with better management um, or management practices that came in and, and, uh, and all, the populations have gone back up and uh, are doing pretty well. Wow. Still not pre-fishing days, but... Uh, we're seeing an increase on this survey. Well, that's good news. We like good news. <laughs> good news, definitely. Um, and while we have these photos up, can you talk a bit about, since we talked about safety, you know, working in the field, safety on the boat? Because you notice here that you're wearing a hard hat, which when I first saw photos of you working in the field, that was something that had surprised me just because it's not something you usually think you wear on a boat. Um, if you could talk a bit about some of those safety practices that you use on the boat. Well, um, that's evolved over time. Um, when I first started going out to see you, I just were out there and you know, your, your clothes and your boots and whatever. Um, over time, we've evolved. You see, I'm also wearing a, an, a life jacket that will inflate if I go overboard. We're also wearing safety glasses and um, hard hats. And uh, if you see, you know, you've got a pretty tight line on that fish. If that snaps up, it could hit you in the eye. It actually has hit people in the safety glasses. We're, we're lucky they're wearing glasses. Clearly, the life vest is if you go overboard. Um, you can see there's an opening on the boat there. Uh, that you could easily fall out of uh, if you're not careful. Obviously in bad weather that gets closed. Um, and when you're setting and hauling the gear, um, the gear, the line, the main line of the gear is over your head. And once in a while, uh, because we're fishing on the bottom, the line will get hooked up on the bottom and it'll, it'll break, okay? And if it comes back and hits you in the head, um, you know, at, at worst it hurts. Um, or at best it hurts, at worst, you know, you might need a couple stitches. So um, we have evolved to wearing all this safety equipment for that reason. Okay. And, you know, some of the preparedness on the boat isn't just for in the moment, the work that you're doing, but 
Um, we took a trip down to visit you and I <laughs> was fortunate to be able to try to put on one of these survival suits, which I've seen before and I've seen them on boats, but I couldn't imagine how hard it was to get on. As everyone can see in this photo, I was struggling pretty bad. Um, if you could talk about that side of, you know, the preparedness on the boat as well, because you are out there for 47 days, weather can change, right. you know, that side of it. Well, um, when you get on on pretty much any vessel, uh, you do get a safety talk, which includes uh, what to do if you, well, what the alarms are, what to do if there's a fire, where to go, what to do if you have to go overboard. Um, the survival suit that you're trying on here, um, theoretically, you should be able to get it into it all the way zipped up and ready to go within less than one minute, which I think we were timing you at, at the time. Yeah, and I didn't make it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you get used to it, you know, you, you have to practice it. Um, and, and when you get on each boat, usually they make you do it at least once or sometimes once every two weeks, uh, depending on, on the vessel. But um, it is important to have these evacuation plans and things like that in your head so that you don't have to think about it. You know what to do um, instinctively in a way because things can, accidents can happen quickly on on vessels. So you need yeah. to know what to do. Um, so for you, you know, in getting to the point where you are in your career, um, <laughs> you know, what, where did you go to school, you know, and how did this all start for you? Yesterday, we read a story, um, Shark Lady, about Dr. Eugenie Clark. Um, so can you give everyone at home, you know, a bit of background, you know, for her in the story, we learned how she was inspired by going to the aquarium. You know, where did your inspiration come from? And then, you know, how did that lead to, you know, choosing a school where you went to school and so on? Okay. Um, well, the aquarium was huge for me. I loved going to aquariums and um, I also loved having fish in, in a small aquarium. I always loved fish, wanted to work with fish of some kind. Um, by seven, I was pretty much set on my career track. I wanted to work on fish in particular and, and sharks if I could. Um, I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area and there was a lot of white shark activity. Um, so we were kind of given that information a lot about the sharks in the area and that kind of thing. So I was pretty excited about that kind of information like a lot of people listening today, I'm sure, are <laughs> on, on the Cape Cod. And um, so I basically planned my life based on the fact that I wanted to PhD in ichthyology and, and ultimately to work on sharks. So I went to Occidental College for college for undergraduate, um, primarily because they had a student run research vessel, an 85 foot vessel that you as a student um, would learn how to do everything equipment wise and go out, um, volunteer your time. Eventually you got paid a little bit um, and we would take schools out and teach them um, the different methods of trawling or dredging and what the animals were and things like that. So I learned a lot there about vessels and um, the fish and, and everything off the coast of California because that, that school's in Los Angeles. And um, I then was lucky enough to be able to go to Moss Landing Marine Laboratories, which is in Central California, part of the um, California state system. And uh, I got my master's working with Greg Kaye, who happened to have a grant working on age and growth of sharks. And I was very fortunate to be there at the right time. And he took me on to uh, work on angel sharks. So that was kind of my first foray into the shark world and, and a little more into the age and growth world. And after that, I came out to the University of Rhode Island Graduate School of Oceanography and continued that work with the um, people, Jack Casey and Wes Pratt and Nancy Kohler, Chuck Stilwell at the National Marine Fisheries Lab. Um, so I got my PhD working with them through, through GSO and um, had a brief foray up to Canada to do some work up there, but then came back and was able to get a permanent position here. So I've been a permanent since 1993 uh, here, but I've kind of been in the apex predators since 84 when I started my PhD. So it's been a long time, but I was very directed. I felt like that's what I wanted to do. And that's how I planned my life. Yeah, you know, I think it's great that you talked about how, you know, 
you had the interest in sharks, but then it was the experience, you know, getting in at Moss Marine Lab, um, looking at age and growth, because I think this yeah. is important for some folks to hear is that, you know, they're excited about sharks. So, you know, we at the Conservancy have had a lot of volunteers in high school and even some in college, we say, well, what do you want to do? I want to study sharks. <laughs> you know, and I've heard from other scientists that you got to start to figure out, well, what do you want to study for them? Right? Right. You know, can you give yeah. me some advice about that? And, you know, sharks are great, but with so many species and so much going on, you know, if they're going to go on for a master's, a PhD, you know, how do you figure out that focus area? Well, one of the things just in, in the career path in general is volunteer wherever you can and, and kind of find out what you can do in sharks. Because So in a way, you're not working on sharks. I, I could do age of growth on anything, kind of. You know, it's the basis in age of growth or the basis in reproduction. You can do it in different species. Um, there are people that do biomechanics of sharks or physiology of sharks. And it's good to kind of have that broad... Um, that broad experience of biomechanics because you can't always work on charts. It's hard to get funding for it. Um, you have to kind of be lucky. I was very lucky in my career to be able to and, and be at the right place at the right time. I, I say, if you work hard enough, you can get there. But a lot of times you might have to do something else for a while. I had to work on age and growth of cod for a while um, to in between my PhD and getting my job here. Uh, so you need to kind of have more than just, I wanna work on sharks, because as you say, there's more parts to it that you have to know what you wanna do. So if you look into what other, um, what disciplines there are like biomechanics, physiology, life history, whatever it is, and then apply it to sharks. Um, I have a friend who's a veterinary pathologist and she works on sharks. So a couple friends actually. So you kind of have to put those two together. And, and the reason I say volunteer is because you might say, well, boy, that sounds really great to do age and growth of sharks, but then you don't like age and growth or you don't like the reproduction or whatever. But if you get a taste of each thing, then you can narrow it down a little more. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do your research on that. Yeah, that's great advice for everyone. And I think another part that we had the question come in yesterday that ties into this a bit is, you know, that PhD level, you know, for you where you are now, did you have to have a PhD? And, you know, can you talk a bit about that for, you know, we had the question come in looking at, you know, do I have to get a PhD, you know, to have a career as a research scientist? Um, you know, or is it a master's? Is it an undergraduate? You know, where that line goes, you know, in the career track? You know, I, I can't speak for all of it, but in general, I would say if you want to lead and direct your own research, you probably should get a PhD. If you want to be the person that goes out and collects the data and goes out to see and do that kind of thing, you probably don't need it. Um, you have to decide what level you want to end up at and then work accordingly towards that because you can work yourself out of what you want to do by getting a PhD because a lot of times you kind of get pushed up to administrative stuff or or that kind of thing. Um, I've been very lucky because I've been able to just do research. Um, but a lot of the PhDs I see ultimately they end up leading a project which is great but they're not doing what they wanted to do anymore. Um, you know what I mean? Yeah, out doing the field work and stuff like that. So you kind of have to decide in whatever discipline you go through where you want to be and, and what you want to do and then decide whether you need the master's, the PhD or, or a bachelor's to do that kind of work. You know, yeah. you can work in charts without a PhD, but it's harder to um, lead your own research and make your, your own way if you're not. And I think that's great for everyone to hear is they really have to think about what do they want to do and understanding, um, you know, we did one of these interviews with Dr. Skolmull recently, you know, and he shared with everyone how the amount of time he spends on the water is very little. He spends mm -hmm. a lot of time in the office, yes. you know, doing other projects. And so I think hearing from you as well that, you know, people really have to weigh, you know, do I want to be out on the field and, you know, in that aspect, or do I want to go on for a PhD? But that means maybe right. some of the administrative, the office work is going to build up. So really having that understanding of where it could take them. 
And and the other thing you can do is you you can you can always stop. I went straight through because I knew what I wanted. Um, but you can always stop. You can get your bachelor's and see if you can get the job that you want to do. And if you get a job and then you say, boy, I really, I don't want to work for someone doing this. I want to be that person. Then you go get your master's. You go get your PhD. You don't have to just run right through it. Yeah. No? Yeah. So no, that's Feel it out. See what you want. That's great advice as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because I think that's another part that people often think is, you know, high school, college, master's, PhD, boom, boom, right. boom, boom, boom. But taking a break in between is an option and it's a good time to explore and figure out, well, do I want that next level? And if I do, what do I want to study in that next level? Exactly. That's great advice. Um, we had a few questions that came in, you know, and this was one that we had sent over to you, really looking at how your job and the work you do helps in shark conservation. Um, if you can explain, you know, a bit about that, which you talked about a little bit in the beginning, um, but, you know, really how your research is applied to conservation levels. So, um, as I said, I, I think I mentioned with the research survey that those numbers go directly into management. Um, the National Marine Fisheries Service is tasked with managing the, the fisheries of the nation, okay? So our data, you know, we're part of National Marine Fisheries, obviously, so our data goes directly to them for that process. The age and growth and the reproductive data fit into what's called demography, which is basically what is going on in a population. Okay, so for example, if we're doing um, a full study of age and growth and reproduction of a species, you find out that, say, the species um, matures at 10 years old and has four pups every other year, and it lives till it's 70. You can calculate how many pups it has throughout its lifetime, which is productivity, which all of that goes into the management process to determine how the population grows and how much can be taken out of it for either fisheries or natural mortality or whatever. And then they can figure out the best practices for management. And as I mentioned, you know, using the data that they have and they update this on a consistent basis, um, we brought the fishery back, the large coastal sharks back from when we first started this survey in 96 up to now um, in increased levels, at least according to our survey index. And um, so, so basically we do this very basic life history data that then goes into the management. Okay. Um, and I think good. that's, you know, looking at the government side of it and that management, you know, part is, you know, is that another, you work closely, you know, on the government. I mean, NOAA is a government branch, um, mm -hmm. but you know, it's not just NOAA you're working with. You also just brought in the National Marine Fisheries Service. So it's well, a different, and I always get this part confused. I yeah, know, I think it's all under. <laughs> National Marine Fisheries is under NOAA. So it's the same thing. Same thing. Okay. Same but thing. The, so the different branches under NOAA yeah. working collaboratively. Okay. Yeah. I think that's what the question that had come in, I think was looking a bit at that, you know, the different groups that are working on it for all that data for the management. Well, and, and we also work with international groups as well. You know, the in, in, um, International uh, Commission for uh, Atlantic Tunas. I can never remember the exact acronym. <laughs> I can't. You know, they, they use our data as well for, for that kind of thing, so. Okay. Um, and in looking at um, a question came in about, you know, those surveys that you've been on, Mm -hmm. um, you know, what has been the most interesting shark species that you've seen? You know, have you had one of those moments where something came up and you were just so surprised, you know, wasn't something you were expecting or you hadn't seen before? Um, not so much that we weren't expecting because it's kind of similar every year, you know, um, but, uh, last time we were out, which was 2018, we got a tiger shark that I'd just never seen anything so big like it's it rolled up on its belly and it was just I can't even describe how big this thing was it was just so fat it was just really amazing it was really cool yeah you know it's kind of things like that when you see something that you know you're getting all these little tiger sharks and all of a sudden you get this just enormous like 14 foot tiger shark but it's not even the length it's just how fat it is you know it, it's kind of cool yeah <laughs> um, <laughs> that's but, cool. I you think know, one of the things that's always amazed me about sharks is everyone always talks about the length 
But when yeah. you actually can see the girth on them, that's what always amazes yeah. me. Like, it's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> and when they get big, they just don't even look like the other ones. I mean, they're just so big. They just look crazy strange, you know, especially when they get so fat. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the thing about, about fishing and, and long lining in particular, you've got hook after hook coming in and everyone's like a little present because you have no idea what's going to be on it. So it's really kind of neat. All of them are neat. You know, the little tiny corb eagles that look like little footballs. Those things are awesome. They're so cute, <laughs> roly poly, you know? So they, you know, they're all kind of interesting in their own way. Yeah. You know. um, and we just had another question that came in, you know, you talked about before that, you know, you're cutting the hooks, um, mm -hmm. but can you talk a bit about what happens, you know, if you're cutting the line and the hook is still in the shark, you know, what happens in that process? Yeah, um, so we cut the line as close as we can to the hook, which usually we can cut the whole line off, um, and the hook does stay in the jaw. They're not stainless steel, they rust out really quickly. If, based on what I see on deck, quite honestly. Um, there are people that ha are doing studies on um, how fast hooks do rust out, but they really, you know, we'd rather pull every one of them out for a variety of reasons, but um, sometimes messing with the shark and handling it is worse than just cutting it, letting it go, um, because they do rot out and they don't, re I, I can't say they don't harm the shark, but you know what I mean. They're yeah. not uh, lethal. Okay. So. Um, and then the other question that we wanted to bring up with you today, and I'm going to share uh, a photo <laughs> here in a moment. Um, but, you know, you are actually getting ready to retire. Um, yes. So can you, you know, what is your advice for the future? And for all the kids at home who are watching, you know, we at the Conservancy are so grateful to you for everything you have done to help teach the next generation. Uh, for everyone who's watching at home, Dr. Natanson has invited, you know, youth who are part of our programs into her labs. She's had kids come out and see some of the necropsies that she's done. You know, you've been an incredible teacher for the youth, but I mean, for me as well, I've learned so <laughs> much working with you. I'm so sad you're retiring. You're still going to get text messages from me and questions. <laughs> um, Good. But, you know, what advice do you have for the future and, you know, as you're retiring, what is your hope for what is to come in science pertaining to sharks? Um, well, I hope all, all this research that we've been doing is, I mean, it's up to the future, these kids right here to make it bigger and better and uh, improve upon what we've done and, and figure out if, if what we've done is, is even correct, you know? Um, science changes with all the new techniques and, and methods of doing something. I, I, I'm hoping that um, people can figure out a way to age sharks better because I don't think we're really doing it right. Um, I have a, a student, Kelsey, you know her, I'm hoping she takes it to the next level. There's some young PhDs like Michelle Passerati who I think are gonna take it to the next level. Um, and, and that's just naming a couple of people I'm closer with. There's a lot more out there than that. And these kids right here, they're the ones coming up after those people. Um, so hopefully all the research on, on sharks will progress. We've gone a long way since I started out and, but there's still more and there's a lot of species out there that nobody's done anything on. So hopefully they'll, they'll do it. And I hope you will still text me and call me because I have. Oh, I will. Don't you time. worry. <laughs> <laughs> and these kids can too. <laughs> <laughs> now that made me think of another question for you you know yeah. because there are so many species of sharks if there was one species that you could work with that you haven't had the opportunity to yet what is your dream species that you could work with wow that i haven't had the opportunity i've never really thought of that um geez you know I don't really know because I kind of love all the species I work with at the time, you know? Yeah. So, I don't know if I can even answer that question. Maybe a whale shark. I'd like to see a whale shark. I've never seen one. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. I, I had the opportunity to see them in the Philippines and it was, it was unreal. I cried. 
I actually had to ascend early because I was crying so much. It was just such a bucket list moment that I went through my right. oxygen in my tank too soon. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> don't recommend that to people. No, <laughs> well, that would be pretty cool. Um, but yeah, so they are really amazing. But so that's when you haven't seen. No, I've never seen one. Because they do, they're in the, well, I guess, because you probably wouldn't catch them in the on your survey, but right. they come up. Yeah. Yeah, no, I know they're out there. And Wayne keeps telling me he's going to take me out there, but it hasn't happened. I'll get on Wayne. <laughs> I'm calling him out publicly. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're actually interviewing Wayne tomorrow, so right, I'll make I know. sure to call him out for you. Yes, you know, I'll be watching. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I think we've got through all the questions that have come in, um, but do you have any other advice or anything that you want to share with everyone before we log off? I think uh, we've covered most of it, but for the most part, if that's figure out what you want to do and go for it and you should be able to do it, you know, yeah. Just talk to the right people and go forward. Awesome. Well, Dr. Natanson, we are so grateful for your time this morning and for everything you have done to help prepare the next generation. No um, congratulations on your retirement. We are so Thank excited you. for you. And yes, you will still be getting lots of texts and probably <laughs> emails from me with questions. <laughs> Good. But for everyone who is at home, um, you know, we will be taking this interview and posting it onto our YouTube channel. Um, and as we were just talking about tomorrow, we are going to be interviewing our spotter pilot, uh, Mr. Wayne Davis, uh, as well as one of the captains we work with, Josh Higgins. So we're going to be looking at the career of a pilot and a boat captain tomorrow. So be sure to turn back in with us tomorrow at 10. Um, and again, thank you so much, Dr. Natanson. It was so wonderful to see you this morning morning and to be able to talk with you and share your story with everyone. Well, thank you for having me. And it was great seeing you. Thank you. All right. Bye, everyone. <laughs>